Well, I'm going to get started as we have people trickling in from um, the waiting room, but uh, welcome everyone. Um, so my name is Jessica and uh, before we get started, I just wanted to connect on a few uh, housekeeping items. Um, so as you can see, I think when you entered, um, your audio was muted. So if we could ask everyone to just turn off um, their their audio, just so that um, there's no um, feedback or disruption there. Um, we are recording this workshop. Uh, so for your own privacy and security, uh, we started off turning off all the cameras um, and feel free to turn your camera off um, for that reason if you're worried about it. Um, and uh, obviously your, your microphone as well. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them out in the chat. And we will have a Q&A period at the end. Um, and I'll read through uh, some of your questions and address whatever I can, OK? Um, if anyone has any access needs, uh, please do let us know in the chat box, you know, if you're feeling like you can't hear um, well enough, uh, if I need to be louder, um, any of that, just let us know and we'll, we'll definitely do our best to, to accommodate. Um, and I just want to give a big shout out to Doris, uh, who is helping us with the back end technical aspects of things uh, for the workshop. She's uh, got her camera off, but she's there busy working and letting people in. Um, so big thank Hi, you. Hi, Doris. Hello. <laughs> thank you, Doris. Hi, everybody. Yeah. And um, so uh, we are very excited about um, this series of workshops, uh, which we're, we're doing to lead up to the launch of uh, our project at York Region Food Network, which is um, the Compost Learning Hub. So this initiative uh, essentially provides opportunities for um, folks to just connect with nature um, and to use compost as a way to uh, reduce the impact on the environment. Um, and at a municipal level, um, food waste is, is very expensive to process. So um, when it enters the landfill, it, it creates, you know, a, an excess of greenhouse gases. Um, but I, I recognize that it's not solely an individual or household issue. Um, so one stat that I wanted to share with you, um, according to the Carbon Majors Report of 2017, 100 companies are responsible for 71% of industrial greenhouse gas emissions uh, since 1988. So that's, uh, that's a pretty significant uh, statistic right there. So at York Region Food Network, um, our mission is to work on this through advocacy and policy work, um, but as well as education and grassroots work uh, within the community. So uh, I just think we all have a, a part in creating a healthier planet for the future. Um, so when we're able to just learn more about the issues, um, build respectful relationships with the land, um, we're better equipped to just to tackle climate change and um, tackle it from a personal and systemic level. Um, so, uh, yeah, in terms of composting, it's a great way to improve soil and grow the next generation of plants, improve our water quality, um, and it just benefit the environment. So for the Learning Hub, we're going to have some educational workshops, um, hopefully in-person tours, uh, we'll see for, for COVID, um, we're crossing our fingers. Um, and then uh, we'll hopefully have those starting in spring 2021. Um, and then until then, we'll have uh, this online forum, so Zoom, where we can do our virtual workshops. Um, and, and so uh, I always say, although we're connecting virtually right now, um, just due to COVID, I, I do encourage uh, fellow settlers to take a moment and let's just reflect on the history of the land that um, you're currently tuning in from. Um, and, and we do this uh, with acknowledgement of the, the intertwining legacies of settler colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so myself currently, uh, I'm tuning in from Williams Treaty in Treaty 3 territory, uh, traditionally cared for by the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples. Um, and we have our neighbors, uh, the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation, as our closest Indigenous community, and they're just about an hour and maybe 15 minutes northeast of us. Um, and so in the same way that 
you know, learning someone's name uh, is a necessary first step in developing a relationship with them. Um, land acknowledgements can be a vital first step in learning who lived and continues to live on this land. Uh, but first steps need to be followed by, you know, more steps and many more actions. Um, so some questions that I wanted to share with you uh, that I've been asking myself and, um, and I think would be helpful to share is, uh, what does it mean to be a treaty person? Um, and what are the principles and responsibilities that we have uh, in relation to each other as human beings and also to this land uh, that sustains us? And how can we show our appreciation uh, to this land through our everyday actions? So I wanna acknowledge the seeds that we're gonna be talking about um, and the practice of caring for these seeds as an integral way for us to connect with the land and to pay respect to the stories that, that this land holds. Um, so as we get into the content of this uh, workshop, let's just continually investigate and bring that to the forefront of these questions. Um, and so we're gonna get started into the content of the workshop. Um, I, I do apologize. I'm actually not feeling super well today. Uh, I was going to do uh, a, just a live presentation with my slides, but um, I do have uh, the exact same slides um, in a video format um, that I've done for a previous workshop. So I will um, play that video, but I'll be around um, for to answer any questions throughout um, and um, definitely in the Q&A session afterwards. Okay, so I'm just going to get set, set up with the video. Um, if anyone has any questions right now, feel free to ask, but I'll get this started. Hello and welcome to our Seed Starting 101 workshop, where we'll go over some of the basics of starting your own seeds. So why would you want to start your own seeds as opposed to going to the greenhouse or the nursery and just getting the seedlings from the stores? Well, starting your own seeds can really help to reduce your carbon footprint in the same way that growing your own food helps to reduce your carbon footprint. Instead of relying on large greenhouses that may transport the seedlings over longer distances, you can actually just get the seeds and start them right at home so you know that you're cutting out that middle transportation step. Another reason is that you can control a lot more of the practices when you're starting your seeds at home. You're able to choose the type of container that you start your seeds in. Oftentimes seedlings come in um, really flimsy plastic and as much as I've tried to not break those plastic pots when I'm taking the seedlings out so that I can reuse them, uh, I do end up breaking at least a few every year and they end up going into the garbage and I feel really sad about that. So starting my own seeds at home has helped me to reduce the amount of plastic that gets thrown in the garbage and eventually goes to the landfill. You're also able to make sure that you're keeping your plants healthy. Sometimes the stuff that comes from stores might have some diseases or pest problems, and it's not something that you'll discover until you bring the seedling home. So starting your own seeds at home really helps to give you some control over the health of your plants and what you're actually putting out into your garden eventually. And my favorite part about starting my own seeds is you get to choose the variety that you want to grow or the type of plant you want to grow. So the stuff that you get in stores is kind of standard, kind of boring. Um, it's the same stuff that you'll see year after year. So you've got tomatoes, you've got your peppers. Um, if you're lucky, you might find the right herbs. But if you take a look at a seed catalog, there are so many varieties out there and it's so much fun to actually flip through and look at the different varieties out there that some have been preserved and the seeds have been saved for generations. Um, some have been bred for taste, for beautiful colors. There are amazing histories and stories behind so many different varieties. So really starting your own seeds um, has a lot to do with food sovereignty. So you're able to decide what types of food you want to grow, 
whether they're culturally appropriate or things that you're familiar with um, or whether you want to try something new. It just gives you that control over um, the food that you want to grow. So let's get into some of the um, details of seed starting. A common question is, when do I start my seeds? So that really depends on what type of plant that you're growing, whether that's tomatoes or okra or callaloo, winter melon. Different types of plants have different hardiness levels. So that means how well they'll survive outside when there's a frost at night. So the important information here is a frost-free date. So a frost-free date is an average date. It takes into account a, a set of data over many, many years, and it creates an average for a certain region. And that average tells you that on this day, there's a 50% chance that you won't have frost. And so that gives you an idea of when you can plant outside. Just keep in mind though, that if there's a 50% chance that you won't have a frost, there's a 50% chance that you will have a frost. So it's not the date where it's absolutely guaranteed to be safe to plant your seedlings in the ground outside. It's just an average and it's just essentially a prediction you'll still have to pay attention to the actual weather and to the actual temperatures on that day. Now the frost-free date is based on um, geographic location. So you'll see here on this map, um, Ontario is split into nine different zones. Depending on where you are, the zones will help tell you when your frost-free date is. Certainly one thing to keep in mind is that microclimates do matter. So what I mean by microclimates is, um, I've known some apple farmers who have had apple trees um, planted along a slope. And on a certain night, when a frost did hit, the trees at the bottom of the slope all suffered frost damage. But the trees at the top of the slope were actually okay. And so um, that's the type of microclimate I'm talking about. Um, you have to pay attention to topography, you have to pay attention to if you're close to a large body of water, um, all of those things do matter. So for York Region, we're in Zone C and Zone D, uh, depending on whether you're in Aurora in South or Newmarket in North. And depending on which data you look at, the first frost-free date can vary. So for example, this uh, table here is, I believe, from the Ministry of Agriculture and Food and Rural Affairs, OMAFRA. And the set of data that they took this from was from 1976 to 2005. So they created the average out of that set of data. And so if you take a look at Zone C, the average date of uh, last spring frost is May 3rd. And if you take a look at Zone D, it's May 11th. So it varies on which zone you're in. And so why does that matter in relation to what we want to plant? Um, like I said, different types of plants uh, will survive better with frost. Um, some are super sensitive, some are very hardy and um, pretty tough. And here's a helpful tool. It's a seed planting schedule calculator. Um, and this is actually from Johnny Seeds. So how the calculator works is you figure out which zone you're in and then figure out your frost-free date. You put the frost-free date in here, click enter, and the calculator will actually generate all of these numbers, all of these, the information in these columns for you. Um, and there's a set list of crops uh, on here. So it's not co completely comprehensive, um, but it is a lot of the popular crops. And here in this column, it'll tell you um, when is a safe time to set your plants out relative to that frost-free date. So for example, cabbage you can see is pretty frost hardy. So um, you can take your seedlings and plant them outside four weeks before the frost uh, is predicted to, to end and it will probably survive. Um, and you compare that to basil, which is pretty sensitive. 
So you're really going to want to be planting it at least one week after the frost-free date. And that way you're really guaranteeing that it will survive. Um, there are lots of recommendations out there to take your frost-free date and then assume that it's going to be a week later. But how do, what does this have to do with starting your seeds? So based on when it's safe to take your seedlings and plant them outside in the ground, you're going to want to start your seeds relative to that. Different plants and different varieties have different numbers of weeks that you should be seeding prior to putting it outside in the ground. So you're going to be doing that calculation of when is your frost-free date, uh, when is it safe to plant outside relative to that date, and then calculate backwards when you want to start your seeds so that it's not sitting in a pot indoors for too long. So some factors to consider for you. Uh, what container are you going to start your seeds in? So the ones here are the ones that you typically see um, and buy from the stores. So they're flimsy plastic, um, but they will do the job. Um, but there are also lots of fun and, and innovative options that you can use at home. Um, so for example, you've got clamshell containers where your cherry tomatoes might've come from. Um, and they've, they've got these, usually these slits at the bottom that let water out. So um, those are great options. Another thing that we've done before is use these newspaper pots. So um, they're cheap, they're environmentally friendly. You essentially roll them up and create little pots out of them. Um, some people will say that you can just throw those directly into the ground when, when the seedling is ready. Um, I don't love doing that just because the newspaper does need to break down. And uh, if the newspaper is not breaking down quickly enough, um, the roots will get inhibited and um, affect the growth of the plant. So usually what I do is just tear off the newspaper, throw the newspaper in the compost, and then plant that, the seedling in the ground. Some other options, uh, toilet paper rolls or cardboard. Um, we have egg cartons here, little paper cups. These are all things that you can find at home and will really help to reduce the amount of plastic waste uh, that comes out of your gardening activities. Um, this one here is a soil blocker. So it's a little um, contraption that you can use to create blocks of soil, essentially, that you'll plant directly into. Um, and this way you're not using plastic at all. You're not even using a container. Um, and so it is very environmentally friendly. It is um, meant to be healthier for the seedlings because they don't get root bound. Um, and they reduce transplant shock. So the plants are a lot healthier and just raring to go as soon as you plant them outside, um, as opposed to when the roots get uh, trapped within a container. Certainly there are some downsides to it as well. Um, it's difficult to monitor the moisture level. Um, and so it might dry out quicker and then you end up overwatering them and you get a layer of algae or, or mold on top. Um, so it just is a little bit finicky, but it is, uh, the benefits are fantastic as well. So what medium are you going to plant into? I know oftentimes when you go to the greenhouse or the nursery or even the stores, um, it's pretty overwhelming to take a look at all the bags stacked in piles. And this one's a seed starting mix. This one's a potting soil mix. This one is compost. This one's manure. What do you use when you're wanting to actually start your seeds? So the seed starting mix is definitely one that's made specifically for you to start your seeds into. Um, it's generally soilless. So there's no soil in it, no field soil, no compost. Um, and so it's sterile. Seed starting mixes are generally pretty low in nutrients, um, and that's because seeds don't need nutrients to germinate. The seedlings and the plants will eventually need nutrients in order to feed itself. Seed starting mixes also generally have very fine particles so that there's a lot of contact between the seed itself and the mix. So usually this is made from milled peat moss, uh, perlite, coconut coir, uh, vermiculite, and it is um, 
the safest option because it's specifically made for successful germination. Now there is also potting soil um, and that can be used for seed starting. Um, it is higher in nutrients and so it's pretty convenient if you're not planning on um, uh, planting your, your tiny seedlings into larger pots for them to grow into larger seedlings. With the nutrients already there, you, you don't necessarily have to worry about changing that medium. Um, there are coarser particles in potting soil, um, and it, it usually does contain some soil or compost or composted manure. Um, so there is a slightly higher chance of some fungus or mold issues. Um, but again, it works fine for seed starting. If that's all you can get your hands on, that's okay. Um, you can use it as well. Now garden soil, uh, that's something I wouldn't recommend. So going out into the field, just grabbing a bunch of soil, bringing it in, and then trying to start your seeds in there, not the greatest idea just because the soil out there does contain weed seeds and diseases and, and some pests and insects that might be detrimental to your seedlings. And so you just have a higher risk of uh, failure when you're, when you're doing that. Certainly you can try that, um, but just the reason we use seed starting mix and even sometimes potting soil is because the ingredients and the portions have been calculated in a way that really sets your seeds up for success. In terms of watering, um, certainly before seeding, mix up your, your planting medium a little bit with some water so that it's um, dark and fluffy. Um, if you're planting into super dry medium, um, it's always a lot more difficult um, to get that germination happening because germination requires water. Now, once you've put the seeds in, um, make sure you keep the soil lightly moist. Um, while the seeds are still germinating. So every single day, check back on it. Um, you can use a misting or spray bottle that works well, but just make sure that there's good drainage um, so that the seeds and roots aren't actually rotting in and sitting in water. In terms of depth and spacing, uh, always read the back of the seed packet um, for the details. Depth is always very important when you're starting your seeds inside. Now, row spacing or plant spacing, um, not quite as um, important to follow this just yet until you're planting your, your seedling outside. Certainly you don't wanna be crowding each cell that you're planting the seed in. Usually the, the rule of thumb is put in more than one seed so that if one seed fails to germinate, you have one or two others that might come up. If it's a type of seed that's difficult to germinate, um, put a few more seeds in each cell. The idea is to get one successful seedling per cell. In terms of lighting, uh, seedlings do need quite a lot of uh, light for optimal growth. And you often hear about the south facing windows having the most light in it. And it's true. So um, certainly if you're growing this at home, place them by a south facing window. Certainly in the spring, the, the duration of uh, sunlight is not always enough for optimal growth. And I'm gonna emphasize optimal growth. So they might do okay, um, but for optimal growth, you might have to add a little bit of supplemental uh, light. So that might be grow lights. And you can hang the lights about two to four inches above the top of the seedlings. And um, seedlings will always lean toward the direction of sun. So if you can have light that's as much on top of the seedlings as possible rather than um, to the side, that will really help for the seedlings to just grow tall and strong. Um, if the seedlings aren't getting enough light, they will tend to get pretty leggy or um, etiolated. So you'll see that between each of those sets of leaves, the stem is pretty long um, and they're kind of leaning and reaching for the light. So you don't really want that. Now this is a uh, germination aids. So sometimes very specific seeds will need a little bit of help from us um, in order for it to germinate. Um, and so what we're doing is mirroring 
something that would happen to that seed naturally if it were outside. So one method is scarification or nicking. Um, and essentially, if you've got uh, certain seeds that have really large and thick shells, you can take sandpaper and just rough up the, uh, the shell a little bit just to help it start to, to open up. Um, there are certain seeds that you might actually nick a little bit uh, with, a, with a knife, sort of like a light scratch. But always, always uh, do your research first. Not all seeds and most seeds that we tend to grow in the garden for food don't need this. I think the common ones for scarification are um, some of the flowers out there like morning glory, um, nasturtiums, that kind of thing. It just helps it to germinate more easily. Uh, it's not always necessary. So just do your research on that. Um, another germination aid might be stratification. So essentially what you're doing is you're simulating a winter period. And some of the seeds just really need that. They need to experience a winter in order to actually germinate. And again, not all seeds need this. And usually most of the ones we're, we're growing in our gardens don't need this. But some of the more uh, perennial flowers um, trees and shrubs. So one common one that would need stratification are apple seeds. Essentially what you do is wrap it up in a moist environment and place it in the fridge for however many months and then you take it out, plant it, and it, it thinks that it's actually been through a winter um, and so it actually starts to germinate. So again, do your research. Uh, this is all just sort of interesting information, but probably not something that we would be doing for the regular garden vegetables that we want to plant. Um, there are certain seeds that uh, it just helps to be soaked. So it might not necessarily uh, need it, but if it does get soaked, it has a higher chance of germinating. So just do a quick Google search, see which ones can, um, can be helped by soaking. So the different types of seeds, let's go over that. There's a lot of uh, confusion around some of these things. So let's actually understand what it is we're dealing with. So heirloom versus hybrid seeds, what's the difference? It gets pretty overwhelming and confusing when you're looking at all the different seed packets. So heirloom or um, heritage seeds, the parents are of the same variety. For hybrid, the parents are different varieties. Okay, um, so for heirloom or heritage, it's a variety that's been maintained for many, many, many years. So a set period of time, which is usually a minimum of 50 years. And so it's been kept for very specific character traits, whether that's a, a particular taste or a particular color, or perhaps it's resistant to a certain type of disease. There's a reason that heirlooms or heritage seeds have been kept in circulation over and over again. One thing to note is if you're getting heirloom or heritage seeds, uh, when you save those seeds and you've done the correct process of saving those seeds, um, they will be true to type. And so you'll get the same variety out of the seed the next season. Whereas for hybrids, um, you're not necessarily going to get a true to type seed and it will be unstable. So saving seeds from hybrid, not the best idea. Now hybridization is a natural process. It's not affiliated with GMO practices. Um, it's not something that wouldn't naturally happen outside uh, anyway. So essentially it's just um, two different varieties breeding together. Um, and the way I like to explain it to people is it's kind of like dogs. So for heirloom or heritage seeds, it's like people having bred dogs um, for many, many, many years, and they're picking the trait that they want. And so eventually we get golden retrievers or we get boxers. Um, and that's a result of intentional breeding, but nothing unnatural has actually happened there. And then for hybrids, uh, essentially they are two different breeds um, having bred together. And so why would why would people do that? Um, oftentimes it's because there's uh, one trait that's great in, in one variety and another trait that's great in another variety and they want to get the best 
of both into one variety. So it can be very beneficial to plant hybrid seeds. Um, just again, keep in mind, if you're going to save the seeds though, you're not gonna want to rely on hybrid plants to save seeds from. And sorry, this title actually says genetically modified organisms. Um, so GMOs, so what are GMOs? Let's clear up some things about it. Um, so GMO seeds are actually not commonly sold in commercial stores. They're actually quite expensive. Uh, for farmers to, to purchase because it is a scientifically and genetically altered crop. Usually large farms will be buying this in bulk. You're not really buying these in individual packets at the stores. One thing to know is there's actually just a handful of GMO crops that have been approved um, by Canada. There's corn, canola, um, soybeans, and sugar beets, cotton, papaya, squash, and feed alfalfa. I'm not going to get too much into the politics of GMOs. Um, it's just to give you an idea of uh, the scale at which GMOs are used and, and where they're most commonly found. So if you're buying uh, individual packets of seeds from you know, just uh, your local nursery or greenhouse or stores, um, you're likely not buying GMO seeds. Now, in terms of organic or not organic seeds, if you're buying organic seeds, they will certainly not be GMO, um, but organic seeds can be heirloom, heritage, or hybrid. And essentially, an organic seed isn't treated with any pesticides or have any uh, chemical coatings. All right, so you've planted your seeds um, and they've germinated for you. What do we do now? So first thing is if you've placed a few seeds in one cell and you're seeing that the cell has more than one seedling come up, um, you might need to do some thinning. This is my least favorite thing to do because I want every single seedling to grow and thrive and be happy and be planted outdoors. But it is a necessary step. If you leave all the seedlings that germinated in the cell, you're going to have a weak seedling that you're putting outside because they're sharing the nutrients in there. They are taking up space from each other. So some thinning might need to be done. Essentially what you're doing is you're pulling out or snipping away or sort of pinching off um, the extra seedlings so that you're left with one in the same pot or container. Sometimes if I see two, I might leave it but certainly if you see more than that, um, just do a little bit of thinning. Uh, it's just part of the process. In terms of fertilizing, um, so seeds themselves don't need fertilizer or nutrients yet. Um, and another reason we might use seed starting mix uh, is that it doesn't usually have fertilizer in it. Um, fertilizers can actually damage some seeds if there's too much of it in the, the medium. So fertilizing can be started when seedlings grow two sets of their true leaves. So in this diagram here, you can see um, the very first set of leaves that a seedling will usually grow are uh, what we call the cotyledon. Usually they'll wither away and die off once true leaves set in. So the true leaves actually take the shape of what the um, leaves of the plant will eventually look like. So when you get two sets of those true leaves, that's a pretty good time to, to fertilize a little bit. And often this is when we take the seedlings out of the small little container it started out in and plant it into or up plant it into a larger pot with actual potting soil and some fertilizer. So you've gotten this far, you've gotten your seedling to a point where it's ready to be transplanted outside and you've checked your frost free dates and you know your seed planting schedule to make sure that it's safe to place outside. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna want to harden it off. You don't want to just throw your seedlings out there and let them fend for themselves without giving them a little bit of a transition time. So what you're gonna do is uh, prior to actually fully transplanting them outside, set the seedlings out in their trays and their pots 
for progressively longer periods of time over one to two weeks. And just kind of keep progressively getting them used to the weather outside, the wind outside, and also being under some direct sun, uh, which is different from what it would get through a window. And then you can actually transplant it. So just do a little bit of planning ahead of time based on your frost free date and when you want to actually plant it outside. So let's go over some common problems. One big thing uh, that happens to seedlings, especially, is damping off. What it looks like is the stem starts to rot. It's sort of weak at the bottom of the stem, and then it starts to just fall right over, just like this photo right here. And what it is, is it's just a soil-borne fungal disease. Um, and it can be caused by if you went outside and you grabbed some garden soil and you just brought it in and planted in that, the fungal disease might have been brought in uh, through that. It can also be caused by overwatering um, and sort of like having waterlogged soil that the seedling is, is constantly sitting in um, or really cool conditions. And so how do we prevent that? Um, you can run a fan. Um, just make sure that you're not drying out the soil too, too quickly. Um, you can try watering from below. Usually I like to do that once the seeds have germinated and some roots have been established so that they can actually reach the water from below. Um, certainly using a seed starting mix that's sterile um, as opposed to potting soil or uh, garden soil is, is very beneficial in prevention. Um, and then just don't overwater. Eventually, you'll, you might start to see some discolored leaves, um, and and usually when it's a, a coloration problem, it's a it means it's a nutrient deficiency. So there's lots of guides online that you can look into about if my plant leaves are turning yellow, if they're turning kind of purple, if it's the outside margins. There's lots of information out there for you to look at. But certainly for prevention, you can just uh, fertilize. Um, at the right times. And eventually the plants will bounce back. You generally don't see quick plant death uh, if it is simply a nutrient deficiency issue. Uh, we've talked about this before. So if you're starting to see on this right, right side, the plant is stretching out, it's very pale. Um, the stem length between the sets of leaves or nodes is very, very long. And it just looks pretty sad. It's got a yellowish, pale, whitish color to it. What's happening is it's just not getting enough sunlight. So it's stretching out um, and trying to reach that sun. And this is both about the intensity of sunlight and also the duration of sunlight. So some ways you can combat this is maybe use some grow lights or have some lamps close by. Again, they're not going to necessarily die immediately um, if you're, it's not getting enough sunlight. It, it just means that the health of the plant will suffer. So this brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, and there are lots of amazing resources out there. Um, I've just list listed here the ones that I've actually referenced in this, uh, in this video. But again, lots of great information out there that you can access. So some of the ones that I recommend here are um, OMAFRA, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, um, has an incredible amount of information on their website. So worth looking into. If you're interested in uh, the conversation around GMOs, the Canadian Biotechnology Action Network, CBAN, uh, has lots of great information. So um, worth looking into uh, if you want to know more in depth about it. I promise we're not being paid by Johnny's, but Johnny Seeds actually does have a lot of great tools and calculators and resources on their website. So um, that's another great resource. But again, there are so many fantastic resources out there for you to find. So it just takes a little bit of research, um, but I wish you the best of luck with starting your own seeds um, and reducing your carbon footprint and the amount of plastic that's being used um, and just having fun and finding the joy in seeing something start from seed 
uh, turning into seedling, eventually maybe producing some food or some flowers, or um, even just existing out there. It's it's one of the best feelings to uh, see from beginning to end. So I wish you best of luck, and I hope you find a lot of joy in uh, this process. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. So. Um... I've seen a lot of questions um, in the chat and Doris is going to help uh, read those out in a second and I can answer uh, um, as much as many of them as I can. Uh, but I just wanted to um, do a quick check in and, and say one thing that I um, really wanted to express in the video but didn't have a chance to which is um, to not get too lost in the technical aspects of seed starting. Uh, I know that presentation was a lot of technical information, uh, but the information is important for you to uh, essentially get the most successful germination, right? Um, so a lot of times that's very important for people who are producing seedlings or producing food. So farmers, um, nurseries, that kind of thing. Um, and it's really good information for people at home to know. Um, but at the same time, um, I encourage everyone not to get overwhelmed by that. Um, just give it a try. Uh, it's just super fun. Um, there's a lot of joy in the process. Um, so don't get too lost in the technical aspects and, and not, you know, have fun with it. So um, that's uh, the, the main thing I wanted to let everyone know about. Um, there is definitely, uh, if I had done a live presentation, I would have added a little bit more information. Um, I can go over some of that if there's not too much, um, too many questions, but let's start with the questions. Um, maybe I'll answer them. Uh, the, maybe I'll actually be talking about those points uh, when answering the questions. So, uh, Doris, do you have our first yes. question? Yes. Um, what do you use to feed the seedlings? Yeah. Um, so, Personally, I use uh, something I believe it's called Actisol, um, and I can share that with everyone in the follow up email. Um, so it's just an organic, um, essentially chicken uh, manure fertilizer. Um, so I'll, I'll write that down to share with everyone. Um, and then the other thing that's really great is actually worm castings. Um, they're packed with nutrients um, and, or, you know, um, it's essentially like putting compost in your fields, right? Uh, but this is for your seedlings. So that's that's a part of um, vermicomposting. Um, and we definitely have some workshops coming up for that uh, if you are interested in that. Uh, but the worms will essentially create a really rich um, fertilizer that you can use to feed the seedlings. Uh, if somebody had 20-20-20 uh, in their cupboard, would that be too much uh, of fertilizer for the seedlings? No, no, it's not. A, it's not about because the 2020 is the ratio, right, of nitrogen, um, like NPK, um, and it's about how much you dilute it into the water. So you're not going to, you, you would overfeed it if you put too much of the fertilizer in your water, um, and then water the plants. But 2020 20 is actually a pretty good balance. Um, you'll see out there different fertilizers. Um, they'll play with that ratio and, and that's sometimes for different needs. So uh, flowering plants might like a slightly different ratio. Um, fruiting plants might might want a slightly different ratio, but 20, 20, 20 is the standard. So uh, yeah, you, you can't go wrong with that. All right. If you prick out the extra um, seedlings, you know, you have the three in the pot, you take out two as an example. Can you transplant them? Yeah, I saw that. I love that idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you certainly can. And, you know, if they survive, great. You've got extra seedlings, right? Um, I, yeah, I think where I was coming from, uh, from that perspective is more so because I, um, I have a background in agriculture, right? So when we're on farms, we're, we don't have the time to do that. Um, so that's where I was kind of coming from. If you're mass producing seedlings, um, then it, yeah, it just doesn't work out as well. But certainly if you're at home and you have that time to care for those seedlings, that's a great idea and um, see if they, they you know, survive. And it's good to do it a little bit early so that the nutrients, um, like you're not, they're not competing for different nutrients where one gets much bigger and the others are, are smaller. So um, yeah, absolutely, go for it. Why did the first two leaves grow longer and longer? I think this actually was addressed in the video. 
Uh, why do you get a, a leggy seedling? Yeah, so if the stem itself is is getting really long, um, then that's a, a indication that there's not enough sunlight. Um, but in terms of the first two leaves, I think you saw in one of the slides, it said a true leaf and a, and a um, sort of like false leaf. And the false leaf is that first leaf that um, essentially comes up to help the seedling uh, receive sunlight and um, you know create nutrients for itself before it actually starts creating all its actual true leaves and its fruiting and all of that. So um, if you're looking at the first two leaves that come out, sometimes their shapes are just essentially really long. Um, um, yeah, they won't look like tomato leaves if you've got a tomato plant. They'll, they'll just look like this long piece, um, like a straight piece of uh, leaf. So uh, there's nothing wrong with it. That's just the shape of that first leaf. Um, eventually it'll fall off and it won't even be relevant anymore. So, yeah. Okay. When do we add the worm castings uh, when starting the seeds? Do we mix it in with the seed starting medium or um, do we... Do we add it in after, you know, after a preferred amount of time when yeah, the two so, true leaves are out? Exactly. So I'd say when the true leaves, when you start to see the true leaves, that's a great indication of uh, that's when you can add the fertilizer. If you add it early, um, it's sort of just kind of a waste. It's, it's sitting there. Um, every time you water it, some of the nutrients might leach out at the bottom. Um, so you're not really doing much uh, mixing it in in the beginning. So um yeah, just wait until the true leaves come out. What are your thoughts uh, on also planting some native species to increase your yard's biodiversity, as well as bring in beneficial pollinators for your veggie garden? Yeah, that's a fantastic, um, fantastic method of, of growing, right? We want to take care of everything, not just uh, what we want to eat. Um, and certainly putting in pollinators and, and native plants will will help the ecosystem and help if you're thinking about your food production, it'll help your food production, right? Um, in terms of having better pollination for your fruits um, and that sort of thing. So I think it's a great idea, yeah. Have the people that registered for today that are here, will they be on your email list or is there some place to get on that email list for future updates for yeah. other workshops? Uh, that's a great, great point. Um, we have a, um, sign up sheet uh, that we'll send out. It's like a virtual or online form. So um, I'll send that out as well in the follow up email. And you can sign up and then we'll let you know about future uh, workshops for sure. Um, someone recommended boiling or microwaving potting mix to sterilize it. Is, do you have any thoughts on that? You know what, I've never done that myself. I know that when you are um, buying uh, certain um, like, like uh, seed starting mixes, they actually will uh, steam treat it, um, like the companies that sell it to you. And that's how, like they'll sterilize it essentially. Um, I've never done it myself, but um, there might be some, yeah, some merit to that. So um, I probably look more into it. I think I've got all the questions now, Jessica. Awesome. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, if you have any uh, follow up questions, feel free to send them through email. Um, and the recording of the workshop, uh, I'll send out to everyone, um, and as well as the resource links and everything that we, we mentioned as well. So um, unless there are any last questions, I think we'll uh, we will end the presentation and thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. So thank nice you. Thank day. you. It was great. Thank Take you very care, much. Everyone.